Welcome to the Axel Brown Harvey postdoctoral seminal series. My name is Yuxuan Miao, and I'm a postdoc at Harvard Medical School. I will be moderating today with Carrie Price, a postdoc at Yale School of Medicine. We are excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Neha Ohuja from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and Jason Smith from University of Chicago will share their research. Each speaker will give a 20 minutes talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. Our first speaker today will be Neha Ohuja. Neha received her PhD at Colorado State University, mentored by Dr. Deborah Garrity. Her graduate work investigated how mechanical forces trigger changes in cardiac valve cell differentiation in zebrafish embryos. Driven by her love of developmental biology, she joined Dr. Anding Wuli Cleaver's lab at UT Southwestern Medical Center for postdoc. She is currently a juvenile diabetes research fellow, and her work focuses on understanding how the mechanosensitive HAPO pathway facilitates pancreatic morphogenesis. Today, she will be talking about the HAPO modulator Merlin and its important role in pancreatic morphogenesis. Neha, the floor is yours. So much uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, I would like to talk about my postdoctoral work, uh, which looks at Merlin and its role in pancreatic development. So the translational reason for this project is to, um, sorry, okay, there it goes, um, is to better uh, treat type one diabetes. So type one diabetes is a disease caused by dysfunction of the pancreas. The pancreas is composed of three distinct cell types. So first you have acinar cells, which secrete digestive enzymes. And then you have ductal cells, which connect the acinar cells to the rest of the digestive system. And then you have these really, really critical endocrine cells, which are located in the islets of Langerhans. So shown here is one such islet. Um, and so you can see that there's several different types of endocrine cells. Um, key for diabetes is the beta cell. So the function of the beta cell is to secrete insulin in response to blood glucose levels. Um, in type 1 diabetes, the beta cells are destroyed, um, which prevents the secretion of insulin and leads to problems regulating blood glucose levels and a variety of uh, deleterious downstream consequences. So um, as a field, we're moving towards this therapeutic approach of regenerative medicine. And so the basic idea would be to take the patient's own stem cells take them down this differentiation trajectory to create these beta-like cells. And then we can implant the beta cells um, into the patient's body, um, either in the arm or near the pancreas, uh, and you know, have a reservoir of beta cells to secrete insulin that way. Um, and we've actually gotten pretty good at this. So we know the factors that are required to generate the beta-like cells. Um, they are able to secrete insulin and respond to blood glucose levels. Um, but one recognized problem is the generation of these pancreatic progenitors. So in vitro, it can take weeks to generate these pancreatic progenitors and uh, a lot of different factors are required for the generation of these uh, cells. Um, and it, it can be quite difficult. So um, we want to improve these protocols by generating more, uh, by figuring out how these pancreatic progenitors um, actually uh, develop. And so, um, I, uh, like most of you in the audience, I'm a developmental biologist, and I resonate really well with this quote, which is that our real teacher has been and still is the embryo, who incidentally is the only teacher that is always right. Um, and so what our lab does is we try to figure out how these pancreatic progenitors differentiate um, in vivo using mouse models with the hope that the knowledge that we learn can be used to better improve these in vitro uh, protocols. Okay, so how do these pancreatic progenitors arise? Well, it happens concordantly with pancreatic uh, morphogenesis. So in a mouse embryo, um, the pancreatic uh, bud is first apparent at embryonic day E925, and it forms as this little evagination off of the gut tube. Um, so it's shown right here. This bud is gonna undergo some rapid stratification. Um, and then by E10.5, we actually already start to see the first signs of cellular differentiation. So the cells on the very outside of this bud are known as cap cells, um, and they're going to give rise to the acinar cells. And they have this very, very distinct sort of bottle cell-shaped morphology. 
Uh, the cells on the inside are uh, called body cells. And so at this stage in development, cells within this pancreas are going to start to undergo uh, microlumen formation, which is also known as de novo luminogenesis. So select cells within the bud are going to uh, reacquire polarity, rearrange their junctions, and then pull apart to actually form a microlumen. These microlumens are then going to fuse to con fuse and connect to form this luminal plexus, shown here at E11.5, and perhaps a little bit more clearly at E12.5. So the plexus is just this looped structure shown here. Um, and this site of uh, looping plex of, of the looping of the luminal plexus is the site where endocrine cells are born. And so this is the niche where these guys are formed. Um, and so another way to look at pancreatic development uh, with the focus more on differentiation is that at E10.5, you have two distinct cell types. You have um, the outer layer of cap cells, which will give rise to the acinar cells, the inner bipotent progenitors, which will then either give rise to the ductal cells or the endocrine cells. So there's still actually quite a lot not known about pancreatic development. Um, so how do cells actually move and coordinate the formation of this luminal plexus uh, is a question that we don't really have an answer to quite yet. Um, but in uh, the past few years, we have learned that the HIPPO pathway isn't really, really key, uh, not just for pancreatic development, but for uh, development in general. And so the HIPPO pathway uh, is uh, really is um, kinase kinase cascade. When the HIPPO pathway is off, these transcription factors called GAP and TAS um, are free to translocate into the nucleus and affect their target genes. When the HIPPO pathway is on, um, uh, MST12 kinases are going to phosphorylate LATS12 kinases, which in turn phosphorylate YAP and TAS and lock their uh, transcription and target them for degradation. Um, and so uh, this pathway is really exquisitely mechanosensitive. So um, things like contact inhibition, mechanical tension, and shear stress um, can all impact uh, whether this pathway is on or off. We also happen to know that HIPPO signaling is really important for pancreatic development. So one of the first papers that looked at HIPPO signaling in the pancreas uh, came out in 2012, and they uh, you know, knocked out MST1 to the utmost stream kinases and saw that the pancreas uh, sort of failed to develop properly. And they also characterized the expression of YAP. And so this is um, a DAB immunohistochemistry stain. And you can see that there's really strong immunoreactivity of YAP in the uh, nuclei of the ductal cells, but in these acinar cells out here, there's much less, uh, suggesting YAP is really active in the, the ductal uh, cells. Um, and we actually followed up on this work with a paper that was published in 2018. Um, so Caitlin Braced, a really excellent postdoc in the lab, knocked out LATS1-2 kinases um, and saw that it essentially blocked pancreas development. Um, and so this uh, is a wild type pancreas shown here, and it's really nice and beautifully branched. And then over here, we see that the LATS1-2 uh, mutant pancreas is pretty much just a rudiment. Um, she also looked at all of the different pancreatic lineages and basically saw that all of them failed to form. Um, and so uh, this is a very, very important pathway in the development of the pancreas, but there's still a lot of questions left to answer. For example, how is the cell type expression, specific expression of YAP achieved? Um, and what is this pathway actually doing to allow development to progress? Um, and so when I started my postdoc, I wanted to look at this molecule called Merlin. Um, Merlin is a firm domain containing protein. Um, it responds to things, uh, it receives cues from cytoskeletal tension um, and adhesion junctions. Um, and it's also able to interact with the HIPPO pathway in multiple ways. So for example, it can promote the phosphorylation of LATS and lead to the inhibition of YAP and TAS outside of the nucleus. Um, but Merlin can also translocate into the nucleus and directly block YAP and TAS there. So because you know it was uh, multiple ways to engage with the HIPPO pathway and it um, had a protein structure that was suggestive of it being receptive to cues from the mechanical environment, I thought that Merlin was a really good candidate to sort of assess how hippo signaling was regulated in different cells within the pancreas. Um, and so that's uh, what my postdoctoral work really focuses on. Um, so the first thing I did was to obtain the mice. So Merlin is encoded by this gene called NF2. 
um, I was able to obtain the NF2 flux flux mice from a collaborating lab. Um, I crossed it with a pancreas specific Cree driver um, and then generated a pancreas specific deletion of Merlin, which I will just call as NF2 pink KO for the remainder of this talk. Um, I wanted to see if these, if these mice survived. Um, and so I bred a bunch of mice and they did survive, but they were um, significantly smaller than their wild type counterparts, starting at the earliest uh, stage of that we were able to measure, which was postnatal day eight. Um, and this was maintained all the way throughout adulthood. Um, so at adulthood, I took out the pancreas and to see what the phenotype was. Um, and you can see that uh, there's some pretty dysmorphic pancreases. Uh, so this, for example, is a control pancreas that I've just outlined here. And you can see it's um, very robust and a highly branched structure. Um, in the uh, loss of Merlin NF2 PKO mice, you can see that the pancreas is already much smaller. Um, to look to see if the pancreas was still able to function, I did a glucose tolerance assay, which essentially just measures how well the body is able to respond uh, and clear glucose. And you can see that there's a pretty significant difference between the um, wild type ability to clear glucose and the NF2 pink AO mice. So all of this is suggestive that uh, Merlin is very important for pancreas development. So I went back into development to see kind of what morphologically and functionally was going on. And so these are whole mounts, uh, immunofluorescence of the E14.5 pancreas. So in the control, um, we can see that, and these are stained from mucin 1, which is the luminal marker. In the control, we can see that we have a really nice, well-formed luminal plexus, which I'm sort of outlining with my arrow right here. So these are the, the loops that will give rise to endocrine cells. Um, and then we can see some of the branch structures that uh, will give rise to the acinar cells on the very outside here. Um, in the mutant, we can see that there is a pretty uh, significant um, loss of plexus. So instead of forming these really tight loops, we sort of get a, this collapse into one giant lumen. Um, we do see that there are some branches that form, um, but they're stunted. And uh, to get an even better idea of what was going on sort of on a cellular level, um, we did some light sheet microscopy and looked at some optical cross sections um, to see uh, what the cell layers were doing. Um, and so in the control, uh, we have a um, mucin 1, which is just this uh, stain here that's marking the inner apical base of the lumens. And then I, I also stain with a basal marker called laminin, uh, which is shown in magenta here. Um, and you can see that we have one cell layer between the mucin um, and laminin. So this uh, epithelium has properly destratified. Um, in the mutant, we can see that there's several layers, four to five, um, suggesting that there's a problem with pancreatic destratification. So we wanted to get a better idea of what was going on on a cellular level. And so we wanted to see how Merlin was uh, impacting the cellular steps required for lumen formation. And um, we actually were able to describe these steps in a paper that we published in 2010. So to uh, form a lumen, one of the first things that happens is we get this apical accumulation of the tight junction protein Z01. Uh, then we start to see the uh, other apical uh, polarity markers like APKC and PAR6B um, come to the apical surface. And these function to then recruit the axomyosin contractility apparatus, um, which then uh, constricts and forms a lumen. So uh, we wanted to see how, if these markers were properly localized in the um, Merlin mutants or the NM2 pink chaos. Um, and generally we found that they seem to be okay. So this, for example, is a Z01 stain in the control. And you can see that it's, you know, really nicely localized at the apical type junctions. Um, generally, uh, it seems to be that the Z01 is also properly localized in the at the tight junctions of the apical surface in the NFC pink KO, um, sort of suggesting that these initial steps of microlumen formation form okay, but that something goes wrong after this. Um, and then because we are in a mouse embryo, uh, and it can be kind of hard to really look at development uh, in sort of static conditions, we also took to an in vitro model of lumen formation called pancreatospheres. Um, so in this model, what we do is we dissect the pancreas um, from an E12.5 uh, pancreatic bed. We disaggregate the epithelial cells 
um, we then uh, grow these cells in matrigel, and the cells actually will then um, divide and form these lumens just sort of like they would exactly in vivo. And so with this assay, we can actually watch this luminogenesis, luminogenesis process happen. Um, and so we did this with both control and NF2 pink KOs. Um, and so at 48 hours of incubation, um, we can see, so these, these are live uh, treated, uh, live embryos that have a reporter in them um, called mirror slated tomato, which is in the membrane of the cells. Um, and you can see that, you know, the lumen is there, uh, the cells are okay in the control. Um, the NF2 pink KO also seems to be generally fine. Um, there's a little bit of extra mercillated tomato signal, but um, the lumen still forms. Um, however, by 96 hours, there's no discernible lumen, lumen anymore, um, which kind of mirrors what we're seeing in our in vivo models. Okay, so then I wanted to think a little bit more deeply uh, about, oh, sorry, then I wanted to look and see how Merlin affected cell fate. Um, and just as a reminder, at E10.5, uh, we have multipotent progenitor epithelium, which uh, segregates off the S inner cells um, and then uh, the bipotent progenitors, and the endocrine cells arise from the bipotent progenitors. Um, so I wanted to see if cell fate was impacted. Uh, and so I looked first at the endocrine cells um, and actually saw that we had a threefold increase uh, in the endocrine volume um, over the epithelial volume. Uh, as compared to controls, uh, which sort of suggests there's an increase in endocrine cell differentiation. Um, we saw the opposite trend for the acinar cell fate. So the, these are whole mount IFs, uh, same with e here to show the epithelium um, and CPA1 to show the uh, acinar cells. Um, and there's a pretty significant and dramatic reduction of the acinar cells, uh, sort of suggesting that there's an expansion of the endocrine compartment at the expense of the acinar compartment. Um, and so we wanted to think a little bit more deeply about what Merlin was doing and how it might be um, functioning to uh, regulate morphogenesis and cell fate. Um, and a few years ago, there was this really, really great paper that came out from Chris Wright's lab um, that showed that apical constriction is required for endocrine cell differentiation. Um, and so here we have uh, the uh, luminal plexus in um, magenta, and you can see an effectin in red, and you can see there's these like really strong effectin foci. Um, and then uh, these correspond to the uh, endocrine cells that are delaminating. So um, if you manipulate pathways involved in an apical constriction, like rail rock, you can actually um, prevent uh, endocrine differentiation. And so I was wondering if potentially the opposite case was true here. So for example, could Merlin actually be involved in inhibiting the actin dynamics that are required for cellular endocrine cell differentiation? And then when we lose Merlin, we get an extra excess of these actin dynamics leading to the um, excess endocrine cells. And so if this was the case, I would sort of expect this to be a cell autonomous function. So that the changes in actin dynamics um, would happen, you know, in the same cell that Merlin is deleted from. Um, and that loss of Merlin would shunt cells into an endocrine cell fate. And so to test this hypothesis, I used a mosaic deletion system. So I deleted a very small amount of the, um, of NF2 from the pancreatic epithelium starting at 8.5. Um, and so using a low dose tamoxifen. And so the idea here was to um, essentially lineage trace what happens to cells that have lost Merlin. Um, and then I evaluated uh, where cells were localized um, at E12.5 and at E14.5. Um, and the idea was essentially that uh, if Merlin functions in a cell autonomous manner, um, then the RFP labeled cells uh, would become endocrine cells. However, if they uh, differentiated into multiple cell types, then Merlin's effect on cell fate would be in cell non-autonomous mechanism. Um, and so at 12.5, when I evaluated uh, if the cells wound up as either cap cells or body cells, I saw that the cells were really able to distribute pretty equally between both compartments. Um, and similarly at 14.5, uh, the cells were definitely not shunted into an endocrine cell fate. They became endocrine cells um, at about the same rate as controls, suggesting that uh, Merlin does not cell autonomously uh, regulate endocrine cell fate. 
Okay, so if it wasn't um, a cell autonomous regulation of actin dynamics, um, then what else could it be? Um, and so uh, I did a lot of reading and I found out that these uh, cells have these structures, epithelial cells have the structure called the um, circumferential actin belts. And it's essentially an actin belt at the apical adherence junctions. And so uh, when cells constrict, um, the cells are able to pull on each other through this adherence, adherence junctions complex um, and transmit tension uh, in this manner. And so I wanted to see if Merlin then impacted the structure or formation or function of this actin belt. And so I started evaluating um, molecules involved in this process. And so for example, this is an e-cadherin uh, stain on wild type and on F2-PNK counterparts. Um, and in the control, you can see that e-cadherin is really nicely expressed at the apical junctions. Um, in the nf 2 pink ko you can see that there's an increase in intracellular e cadherin signal, as well as these vacuoles um, at the junctions, sort of suggesting that the cells are uh, not able to form these junctions very well. And then this has been corroborated in our TEM data. Um, we also see that there's a loss of constriction as evidenced by a decrease in phosphomycin light chain staining shown here. Um, and uh, as a possible downstream effector, we see that there's a pretty significant increase in uh, nuclear YAP amino reactivity, as well as transcriptionally uh, an increase in YAP target genes like CIR61 and CTGF. Um, and so uh, we thought that potentially Merlin could be modulating this actin belt to facilitate cellular communication. Um, and we decided to use the same mosaic deletion system to actually evaluate this. So our reasoning was that if Merlin is not involved in cellular communication, um, you know, we would see defects in our deletion cell. Uh, we might see intracellular junctions and high, higher levels of YAP, um, but the neighboring cell would be fine. If, on the other hand, uh, Merlin is involved in cellular communication, we would expect our neighboring wild type cells to have higher levels of YAP and maybe defects in junctions as well. Um, and so this is uh, some preliminary analysis. Um, the deletion cells are shown here in yellow. Um, you can see in the control, there's a pretty homogeneous distribution of YAP throughout the epithelium. But in the mosaic KO, we have higher levels of YAP in the cells where we've deleted Merlin, but also the neighboring cells right here, um, sort of suggesting that Merlin is involved in facilitating cellular communication. Um, and we're currently trying to determine how Merlin could be responding to mechanical cues. And on a molecular level, Merlin has two general functions, one as a scaffold and one as a tumor suppressor through its uh, interaction with YAP. Both of these functions are regulated by phosphorylation at uh, serine 518. And so I wanted to ask the question if Merlin activity could be regulated by tension by asking for a phosphorylation. And so we went to an in vitro approach. Um, so I use these cells called human ductal pancreatic epithelial cells. Um, and I use a bioreactor called the flex cell. And essentially uh, what I do is I seed these cells at a high confluency. So they form an epithelial monolayer. Um, and then I stretch them very slightly using this reactor. Um, and you can see that you know uh, there's a pretty robust response. So we have a pretty robust increase of phosphorylation at um, this residue. Um, in the stretch condition as compared to the static condition. Um, and so just to summarize uh, my talk really quickly, um, in the control, uh, it, the pancreas forms a nice, really beautiful plexus, but in the Merlin knockout conditions, we have these dysmorphic and large lumens um, and excess of endocrine cells and a loss of acinar cells. On a cellular level, we think that Merlin may function to facilitate uh, communication through this actin belt. Um, and we're currently sort of figuring out if Merlin can respond to cues from the actin belt or where uh, it's more for facilitating its assembly. And we're doing that through a combination of proteomic approaches and in vitro approaches. Um, and just really quickly, I would really like to thank um, my lab and my mentor, Dr. Andine Cleaver. Andine is um, a really, really amazing postdoctoral mentor. And this, so much of this work uh, is due to you know, her um, helping and mentoring me. Um, I'd also like to thank my lab uh, and the collaborators that we have here at UT Southwestern who have been absolutely amazing, um, and as well as the core facilities and our funding, which came from JDRF and NIH. Um, and thank you guys all for coming to my talk, and uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Neha, for the wonderful talk. Um,
Okay, so yeah, just to remind the audience, if you have a question, please type in the Q&A box. And already we can start with um, um, Augusto. Um, cool talk. How do you explain the glucose intolerance in your conditional knockouts if they have more endocrine cells than the wild type? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, and so uh, we think that the endocrine population is transient. Um, and so we've done a lot of work to characterize the amount of endocrine cells that are there at E14.5 um, and at later stages. And we sort of start to see a decline in the number of endocrine cells that are present at around P10 or so. Um, and so uh, we're not 100% sure what causes this decline quite yet, but um, the, it, it, this increase in endocrine cells is, is a temporary situation. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have a question. I Great. I wonder, have you checked like other signaling pathway? Do they also have like crosstalk with the YAP? Because for example, in the intestinal work noise, uh, YAP will interplay with like notch signaling to to determine like cell phase and morphogenesis and so on. I wonder what's yeah. in your situation. Yeah. Yeah, we've actually started to do some single cell sequencing on the control and the mutants. Um, and there's a couple of different signaling pathways that have been implicated. So um, the strongest, of course, was hippo signaling, but we also see uh, changes in um, uh, mTOR as well as RAS, uh, RASERC. And so we're we're in the process of sort of teasing that all out, I guess. Um, but there's, I think, a really big potential for crosstalk with this pathway. Cool. Um... Yeah, so while while we're waiting, um, what kind of implication do you think your your work had for um in terms of how to improve like in vitro generation of beta cells and so on? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question too. Um, so uh the um idea for us is I think to kind of help figure out how cells are responding to the mechanical environment and how that helps us with the um, developments, proper development and differentiation of the cells in vivo. I think it's really important to figure out how these cells are responding to things in vivo, because then, for example, we can start to have an idea of what, like, the optimal geometry we should be growing the cells in, uh, in, uh, in vitro conditions, right? So we could maybe start to consider growing the organoids and pattern plates, or, um, if we need to, like, actually physically stretch cells to, uh, support getting more pancreatic progenitors. Um, it, it's things like that that I'm hopeful that this work can be applied to. Yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, we have a, another question from Tim. Uh, cool staining, in your Merlin conditional knockout pancreas, did you rule out defects in cell proliferation or survival atop of cell fate? Or do you suspect both cell fate change growth uh, are, are not mutually exclusive? Yeah, so this is a really, really good question, um, too. Uh, lots of great ones. Uh, so um, we've done a lot of stains, for example, for blastohistone uh, at 12.5, 14.5, 11.5 to look for a change in cell proliferation. Um, we haven't really seen one at all. Uh, we also have done uh, some evaluation of differentiation markers, like for example, there's an increase in um, the expression of NGN3, which is a, a differentiation marker for uh, endocrine cells. Um, and so, you know, it, it's hard to completely rule out proliferation because it can always happen, you know, at a short time or uh, in a place where you haven't checked. But I think the abundance of evidence points to that this is a change in how the progenitors are, differentiation, are differentiating. Okay, cool. Um, and maybe one last quick question, like how, because like in, in our embryo development, we have so many lumens forming. Do you think there are yeah. some common themes, like yeah, yeah, other systems? Yeah, yeah. There's absolutely a lot of common themes um, with Yap and Merlin and, and lumen formation. So it's been really extensively studied, um, for example, by John Wu here at UT Southwestern. Um, and, you know, the Merlin, for example, too, has been knocked out of the kidney, which is also sort of a luminal network. Um, and, and there's similar themes where we see that there's this uh, enlarged luminal cyst structure that forms. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, we still have to figure out what the cellular and molecular dynamics are at play, which is what I hope to do. Okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you very much, Neha. Thank for you. Talk. Yeah.
Now I'll hand over to my co-moderator, Carol Price. Thank you, Yuchuan and Miha. So I am delighted to introduce our second speaker of the session, um, Dr. Jason Smith. Uh, Jason is a third year postdoc in the lab of Dr. Pascalis Kratzios at the University of Chicago, where his work focuses on characterizing the contribution of Hox genes to the establishment and maintenance of motor neuron identity and function in the C. elegans ventral nerve cord using cell developmental and transcriptomic approaches. And since beginning his postdoc, Jason has already authored or co authored seven papers with several more in the pipeline. Um, Jason received his PhD in the lab of Dr. David Mattis at Stony Brook, where he was a Turner Fellow, and there his work focused on the gene regulatory transcription factor networks governing cell invasion and chromatin remodeling. And in addition to his research, Jason has been very active at the MBL. He was a student in the embryology course in 2018, and then he later TA'd the course in years 2021 and 2022. And Jason, we look forward to your talk, so please uh, share your screen and begin when you are ready. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for that excellent introduction. And I'd like to also start by thanking the SDB and the organizers of the Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoc Seminar Series. It's really a, a great honor to be able to talk to uh, the broader SDB community about my work as a postdoc. So uh, as the title of my talk suggests, I study the nervous system. And one of the most interesting and unique and challenging aspects of studying the nervous system has to do with an incredible degree of cell type diversity that, uh, that, consists, that it consists of. So when we look at other tissues in humans, for example, heart and liver and intestine and epidermis, what we find is each is composed of just a handful, a, a dozen of cell types. Whereas in the adult nervous system, it's actually unknown exactly the number of cell types that it consists of, but we know that it's composed of billions of neurons and um, likely thousands of cell types. And so one of the, my main interests is understanding this cell type diversity in the context of adult nervous systems. So what is a cell type in the nervous system? Well, there are two basic types. There's glia and neurons. Um, and today I'm only focusing on neurons, which themselves can be classified into types based on a variety of criteria. So um, neurons can be classified into types based on shape or morphology. Um, they can be functionally classified based on whether, for example, some neurons receive information from the environment and transmit it to the central nervous system. Those would be called sensory neurons, whereas others receive information from the central nervous system and uh, affect things like muscle contraction, and we call those motor neurons, and that's really the main focus of my postdoctoral work. And so another way that we can classify uh, neurons into cell types is based on gene expression with profiling um, techniques, where we look at the expression of hundreds or thousands of genes in individual neurons, and then we group them into types based on similarity of their transcriptomes. And that's the level of cell type that I'm talking about in the context of my postdoctoral work. So why study adult motor neurons? Um, so People have been studying motor neurons for a really long time, over 100 years, for a variety of reasons. And the majority of that research is really focused on the early developmental events that uh, give rise to motor neurons. So we know in great molecular detail events like how motor neurons are born and differentiate, how they migrate, and how they uh, form axons and so on. But this emphasis on early development has really left a lot of questions about how these, these post-mitotic cells um, establish and maintain their identity throughout life. So in the case of humans, uh, how do motor neurons, for example, maintain their identity and function for decades? So one reason to study uh, adult motor neurons is we don't really know much about them. Um, another reason is that when adult motor neurons lose their uh, identity and function, it leads to um, often fatal diseases like ALS. And finally, to sort of refer back to my first point on my first slide is we actually still don't really know much about how molecularly diverse motor neurons are in adult animals and in humans. And so this brings us to my uh, central question that really drives my work as a postdoc, which is I wanna understand what molecular mechanisms determine motor neuron identity and function throughout adult life. So um, I study adult motor neurons in C. elegans, which is a fantastic model for this for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason is that it doesn't take very long to get adult motor neurons. C. elegans uh, develop rapidly. Uh, in three days, they go from egg to egg-laying adult. 
Another reason C. elegans is a great model is it has a simple nervous system uh, composed of 302 neurons, which allows me to study adult motor neurons uh, comprehensively. Um, C. elegans are very genetically tractable. So we have you know, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing and we have genetic access to the entire nervous system. And finally, um, they're really amenable to locomotion and behavioral assays, as, which we can use as readouts for perturbations that we um, induce in adult motor neurons. So today, the, the structure of my talk is going to follow two really key surprises that um, came from my work as a postdoc so far. In the first case, that this simple nervous system uh, is still characterized by a really striking degree of molecular diversity in adult motor neurons. And second, um, the second surprise is that I uncovered this really interesting non-autonomous role for a key transcription factor in C. elegans motor neurons called UNC3. Okay, so to return to my, um, my central question, right? What are the molecular mechanisms that drive motor neuron and identity and function throughout life? I first have to have a sense of the molecular nature of motor neurons in an adult animal. Uh, so to do that, I molecularly profiled all the adult motor neurons in C. elegans. And so here you can see them in a schematic from anterior to posterior. They're, um, they're, they're contained within the structure called the ventral nerve cord, which is analogous to the vertebrate spinal cord. And so to profile these, I used uh, single cell RNA sequencing, which depended on a combination of fluorescent reporters, which together label all the motor neurons in the ventral nerve cord. And then with help from collaborators in the David Miller lab um, at Vanderbilt, we performed fluorescence activated cell sorting and single cell RNA sequencing to generate ultimately 13,000 adult motor neuron uh, profiles. And so these motor neurons um, relate back to the eight motor neuron classes that exist in adult C. elegans ventral nerve cord, which were originally described based on their anatomy. And so a fine-grained analysis of these uh, motor neurons through single cell RNA-seq um, brings us to the first really major surprise for my postdoctoral work, which is that in C. elegans, in adult C. elegans, there's a striking degree of molecular diversity in adult motor neurons. So it turns out that from this profiling, we discovered uh, these eight anatomical motor neuron classes break down into 29 molecularly distinct motor neuron subclasses. And so uh, just to remind you, there are only 75 motor neurons that drive locomotion in C. elegans, and they break down into 29 molecularly distinct subclasses. So that's almost two and a half motor neurons per molecularly distinct subclass. So there's just an incredi incredible amount of molecular diversity in the adult motor nervous system in C. elegans. And so next I wanted to investigate on the basis of what types of genes, uh, what gene families are these 29 adult motor neuron subclasses delineated or differentiated. And so one of the most interesting gene families was the homeodomain transcription factor genes. Um, it's very interesting because, of course, as we know, these have been studied extensively in the context of, uh, of animal development. Um, but here what we found is that actually 40% of the homeodomain transcription factors that are embedded in the C. elegans genome um, persist in terms of expression across these adult motor neuron subtypes. Uh, further, what we found is that just, these 30, just using these 39 homeodomain transcription factors, um, we can cleanly delineate each of the 29 adult motor neuron subclasses. And I just want to highlight, uh, you know, the Hox genes, of course, as uh, homeodomain transcription factors, which have been, you know, infamous for their roles in early body patterning. Here we show that um, beyond early development, actually, the expression of Hox genes in these adult motor neurons indicates a new function where they may control identity or uh, function in adult motor nervous systems and differentiate between these uh, various adult motor neuron subclasses. So going beyond C. elegans, we, we wanted to understand if these organizing principles with respect to the uh, combinatorial expression codes of homeodomain transcription factors in Hox, for example, um, are conserved or are they C. elegans specific? Of course, homeodomain transcription factors are conserved. So it seemed reasonable to ask this question in another system. So uh, what we did is we collaborated with a group at Stanford uh, in the Gitler lab and the postdoc Jacob Bloom, who had already performed single cell RNA sequencing on adult mouse spinal motor neurons. So what we did was we performed an independent analysis with these organizing principles that we learned from C. elegans in mind on their data set. And just to orient you to mouse motor neurons, they come in two basic varieties, which are visceral motor neurons that control smooth muscle and skeletal motor neurons, which control skeletal muscle. 
And so amazingly, what we found is actually at every level with respect to the homey domain transcription factor themes that we discovered in C. elegans, we, uh, there is conservation in uh, the adult uh, mouse spinal cord. So for example, um, there's persistent expression in the case of mouse of 30% of the homey domain transcription factors that are embedded in its genome. And this includes the majority of Hox genes. And that combinatorial homey domain transcription factor and Hox codes are sufficient to delineate all of the adult motor neuron subclasses in mouse as well. So that was really the bit, first big surprise was the striking degree of molecular diversity that we uncovered in C. elegans and that these um, we uh, appear to assembled about, upon some conserved organizing principles. Um, the second major surprise that arises from our work I'm gonna transition into now is the discovery of a non-cell autonomous role for a key transcription factor in motor neurons called UNC3. So I wanted to ask this question. So what happens when motor neurons fail to establish identity? And to do that, I looked at a mutant for a transcription factor called UNC3. Our lab has been interested in for quite a while. And one of the reasons that it's an interesting transcription factor is it has a highly specific um, expression pattern where it's only in a subset of motor neuron subclasses in adults called, uh, which are cholinergic. And it doesn't express in these other motor neuron types, which are GABAergic. And so here you can see in wild type, we have this beautiful sinusoidal locomotion of C. elegans. In UNC3 mutants, um, the animal is mostly paralyzed and uh, with the exception of a little bit of movement of head indicating this um, a functional role for UNC3 in, uh, in adult motor neurons. And so UNC3 has been a subject of study for over a decade and we've learned a lot about it. Um, we know, for example, that it binds directly through a motif to activate dozens of identity genes in the cholinergic motor neurons that it's expressed in. Another reason we're really interested in, in understanding um, UNC3 in our lab is because the human orthologue EBF3 has been associated with uh, the development of all kinds of neurodevelopmental disorders and diseases. So when I started as a postdoc, what we understood about, everything we understood about UNC3 came from these biased or, or these candidate gene approaches. And uh, furthermore, everything we understood really derived from the motor neuron subclasses or classes that express UNC3 to begin with. So it seemed like a tremendous opportunity to perform single cell RNA-seq in a mutant, but to collect both populations of motor neurons that express UNC3 and that normally do not express UNC3. It's one of the tremendous advantages of doing this kind of an approach. And I think it's a unique aspect to this study is that we performed single cell RNA sequencing comprehensively throughout the uh, motor nervous system in a mutant and compared cells that express UNC3 and that don't normally. And this um, brings an unbiased you know, lens to our understanding of UNC3 to complement the candidate gene approach that had been used uh, previously. Okay, so what happens when you lose this key transcription factor? Um, the first thing that we noticed is that among 18 distinct motor neuron subclasses that express UNC3, identity completely collapses into three mutant motor neuron populations. And so each of these populations uh, fail to express any markers that would indicate uh, either a subclass or a class identity. So it's really indicative of a true collapse in identity when we lose UNC3. And then there's a final uh, four motor neuron subclasses which experience a partial loss of identity. So in total of the motor neur of the 22 motor neuron subclasses which normally express UNC3, in the mutant we find a collapse into about seven. And so that collapse of identity is really indicative of this classical role, this canonical role that we understood UNC3 to have, which is that it activates motor neuron identity genes. But the RNA-seq also suggested that UNC3 has a, a major repressive role and that it, re that it represses thousands of genes, which we um, were undetected before using a candidate gene approach. And so I was really interested in understanding what these genes might be. And so I decided to look closer at them. And one of the most interesting findings is that among these genes include uh, genes that encode alternative motor neuron identity features. So for example, um, cholinergic motor neurons normally do not express uh, alternative or GABAergic identity markers. And when you lose UNC3, what we find is this massive ectopic expression of these GABAergic markers. And so I went and validated um, a lot of these genes in vivo. And so here's a, a, that same marker for GABAergic motor neuron identity. Normally in adults, we have um, around 18 or 19 GABAergic motor neurons. And when we lose UNC3, what we see is uh, many more. So this is a validation of our RNA-seq evidence. But everything that I've told you so far relates to this null allele of UNC3. And um, my central question is about 
mechanisms that are active in adult motor neurons to maintain their identity and function. So I next wanted to investigate, is this role that UNC3 has in repressing alternative identities um, just a developmental role or is it maintained throughout adult life? And so to do this, what I did is I adopted a um, conditional depletion strategy that allowed me to skip the two waves of motor neuron birth that happen early in development to wait until motor neurons have achieved their identities uh, as cholinergic and then to deplete um, UNC3 and then look later in the adult to see if we see similar effects as we saw with the UNC3 null mutant. And so in fact we do. And so um, what this argues is that this role for UNC3 in repressing alternative motor neuron identities is not just developmental, but it, UNC3 is in fact continuously required to maintain adult motor neuron identity. Okay, so that brings us to the second surprise. So I just told you about what happens in the motor neurons that express UNC3 when uh, in the absence of it. But I mentioned that the single cell RNA-seq strategy that I used actually also capper, captured uh, motor neuron subclasses that never express UNC3. And so the relationship between these two uh, types or class subclasses of motor neurons is that the UNC3 positive cells are activating and they release um, excitatory signals to body wall muscle to stimulate them to contract. And they also activate GABAergic motor neurons that don't ever express UNC3, whereas GABA um, are inhibitory and relaxed muscles. And so as we expected, overall, um, the GABA identity is intact in an UNC3 mutant. So when we lose UNC3 in cholinergic motor neurons, overall, we don't see massive dysregulation of markers for GABAergic identity. But the surprise was that we found hundreds of genes that are ectopically expressed in these motor neurons, indicative of a non-autonomous role for UNC3, where UNC3 loss in cholinergic motor neurons induces massive transcriptomic changes in GABA. And so um, again, I validated this result with a variety of reporters here. I'm showing an endogenous reporter in um, ventral nerve cord motor neurons in an adult and wild type. And when you lose on three, you can see this massive um, expansion of the expression domain and um, ectopic expression of this reporter in GABA motor neurons when you lose on three. And I went on to do this with um, many other genes and, and showed much the same thing. But beyond transcriptional regulation, I was interested in understanding, I mean, how, how far does this non-autonomous effect in GABA motor neurons go when you lose UNC3 in cholinergic motor neurons? And so I decided to take a look at morphology. And so in C. elegans, uh, motor neurons and neurons in general have very stereotypical um, axonal projections. In the case of motor neurons of GABA, you can see that the, the first two, the anterior two go left and the rest go right. And when we lose UNC3, what I found is that there were um, morphological defects with the axonal projections in GABA. So this is reinforcing that transcriptional effect. But here we're seeing a morphological uh, phenotype, morphological evidence of a non-autonomous role for UNC3 in GABA motor neurons. And um, further, it's not just morphology and transcription, but it's also the connectivity. So we have um, electron microscopy data from wild type animals and from UNC3 mutant animals. Uh, from John White, and a preliminary analysis of these data suggests that um, the connectivity is also disrupted in uh, GABAergic motor neurons when we lose UNC3 in cholinergic motor neurons, again, arguing for a non-autonomous effect. Okay, so the next thing I was wondering about, the next question was, is this really a non-autonomous role for UNC3? That is, um, is UNC3 really behaving through the loss in the cholinergic motor neurons, or does UNC3 have an early developmental role, for example, in the lineage of GABAergic motor neurons? And so I took advantage of this really excellent and amazing study um, from 2019 in science, where um, this group performed single cell RNA sequencing on a variety of transcription factors throughout the entirety of uh, C. elegans embryonic lineage, right? And we know, of course, um, remind everyone that C. elegans has an invariant lineage. And so I decided to to hyper-focus on the lineages that uh, give rise to GABAergic motor neurons. And what I found is that um, there's no evidence from fertilization clear through the terminal divisions of GABAergic motor neurons for any UNC3 transcript um, or protein. So this does seem to be a bona fide non-autonomous role for UNC3 in regulating uh, GABAergic motor neurons. Okay, so I'm, I was interested, and I'm still interested, and this is ongoing work, in trying to pin down the mechanism. How is UNC3 having this non-autonomous role in GABAergic motor neurons? And so um, there's two kinds of ways it, that I can think that it could be doing this. One is a transmission-dependent mechanism. So I mentioned that cholinergic motor neurons, that the UNC3-expressing neurons are upstream 
of GABAergic motor neurons that are UNC3 negative. And so it's possible that when we lose UNC3, since we know from previous work, it activates genes that drive the signal, the activating signal that GABA responds to. It's possible that the dysregulation that we see in GABA motor neuron transcriptome is a consequence simply of interrupting this um, input and that GABA simply requires an input. And I'm testing this transmission dependent mechanism now by, um, by inducing uh, defects by deleting um, using mutants of these two genes that are downstream that are important in this pathway so that I can see if there are defects in GABA motor neurons when UNC3 is still present, but we don't have activation of, uh, we don't have this, this um, excitatory signal going to, into GABA. Another possibility um, or, or genre of mechanisms. Minute. Okay, thank you. Another uh, genre of mechanisms include the transmission, uh, transmission independent mechanisms. These would be ones that don't rely on this input, but on something else. One possibility is that, um, of course, when we lose UNC3, now we don't have that excitatory input I mentioned. And so maybe the muscles are sending out a signal because all they're getting is uh, inhibitory input. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and this is kind of in vogue now, it's um, two, paper, two major papers this week published in Seattle against discussing this idea of um, extrasynaptic signaling. That is, neurons uh, release signals outside of the synapse that diffuse through the extracellular matrix and bind to G protein coupled receptors on other neurons, often distant neurons, to, um, to trigger transcriptional changes. And so one possibility uh, is that UNC3 is upstream of this kind of a process, which my um, evidence from RNA-seq and in vivo validation does suggest that UNC3 is driving some of this neuropeptide signaling in cholinergic motor neurons. And I'm testing this hypothesis um, right now by using mutants that abrogate or that block all neuropeptide signaling um, to see if we see similar, if we still see the same autonomous effects, non-autonomous effects, when we lose um, neuropeptide signaling in, ga in uh, GABAergic motor neurons. Okay, so I want to conclude just by reviewing my main question and kind of relating some of the major findings and surprises of my work to the main question. So again, I'm really interested in understanding what molecular mechanisms determine motor neuron identity and function throughout adult life. And the first big surprise was that uh, even in a simple nervous system with these eight anatomical motor neuron classes, we see a really striking degree of molecular diversity in adult motor neurons with 29 molecularly distinct motor neuron subclasses. Um, further, we find that uh, home domain transcription factors, including HOCs, persist in terms of their expression in adult motor neurons and actually can be used uh, to delineate individual motor neuron subclasses based on their combinatorial expression. Um, I want to focus on HOCs to reiterate that these, these HOCs genes have been uh, focused on primarily in the context of development. And here we see four out of the six HOCs genes in the C. elegans genome persist in expression and are expressed in adult motor neuron subclass specific uh, manner, indicative of a potential role for maintenance of identity and function in adult uh, animals and adult motor neurons. And I mentioned that all of these different features I just mentioned uh, were conserved when we performed the independent analysis in um, adult mouse motor neurons. I talked about what happens when you lose this uh, terminal identity in these cholinergic motor neurons with 22 motor neuron subclasses breaking down into seven uh, mutant motor neuron clusters. And finally, um, I, I talked about this uh, unraveling or unveiling this new non-autonomous role for a key transcription factor, UNC3, um, in GABAergic motor neurons. So I want to conclude by um, thanking everyone in the lab, past and present, especially Pascalis, who's been a fantastic mentor. Um, I want to thank our collaborators, David Miller and Seth Taylor, the Jorgensen Lab and CGC for Strains, um, my department at the University of Chicago, and of course, uh, the Society for Developmental Biology, again, and the Ethel Brown Harvey postdoc seminar organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, so while we wait to get things going, I'm curious if you've started to, or thought about beginning to um, functionally characterize these 29 motor neuron subglasses. Yeah, yeah, so um, for sure, right? That's that's the big question. And um, with respect to these codes of homing domain transcription factors, there's a lot there to look at and whether, uh, similar to UNC3, they have a maintenance role where if you lose them in adults, um, you lose these subclass specific identities. I got into a little bit of that with the UNC3 analysis um, where we have this you know, broadly uh, expressed transcription factor. And when it's there, you have 22 dis distinct motor neuron subclasses. And when you lose it, 
you get seven. Um, but yeah, I would love, and I plan to uh, continue to investigate the sort of refinement of these adult motor neuron subclasses and their maintenance in the in uh, adult C. elegans. Um, Augusto writes, interesting work. I'm curious about the ratio of 75 neurons present in the animal with 29 different neuron subclasses. Do you expect that every single individual worm will have all 29 subtypes, or do you think the neuron diversity you found resembles interworm variability? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, something I didn't get a chance to show is that I, uh, in, for a, uh, many, many genes, I validated in vivo with reporters. Um, and I looked at, you know, if a gene was suggested to be expressed in a certain group or in an individual motor neuron subclass, I validated that with reporters. And it, it seems to be really the case that in fact, some individual motor neurons, like the most anterior motor neuron of a certain class will be its own molecularly distinct subclass and will express its own you know, set of dozens or hundreds of genes that um, some of which I validated. So I do think that this diversity actually does reflect the, the actual real motor, uh, molecular diversity of motor neuron types in um, every single adult C. elegans. Okay. Um, I'm just curious if you have, so this was all done in adults, adult worms. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Um, just if you think that the pattern, you know, that's combinatorial code might change if you were to look earlier in development before the motor neurons are identified, oh, terminally identified. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one thing that, that I, that I did was I went back to um, a larval, uh, a larval stage. There had been a previous study that published um, the larval transcriptome of motor neurons and of, well, just of the entire nervous system, actually. And so we went back and actually using some of the information that we generated in our really focused approach in motor neurons in the adult, we were able to refine, um, to refine that data set. And we found that these motor neuron classes do exist, at least some of them earlier in development. Um, before the birth of the motor neurons, you know, likely not, um, because you know, obviously, but yeah, it does seem like these there, you basically generate a bunch of diversity uh, in development, and then you maintain that in the adult, which is really um, an interesting finding because there's evidence in, in other systems, like in mouse, that, um, preliminary, you know, some evidence that you generate a bunch of diversity in development, and then that diversity gets trimmed down for the adult state. And what we're finding here is that, you know, this striking diversity is actually maintained uh, through adulthood. Cool. Um... Well, um, I think that I don't see any more questions. Um, okay, well then, uh, thank you. Thank you so well, much. Yeah, uh, so thank you, uh, Neha and, and, and Jason for your excellent talks. And um, this seminar has been recorded and it will be available on the SDP website next week. So please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, December 8th, when Yuki Shindo from Dartmouth College and Rashmi Patel from the National Cancer Institute will present. Um, and thank you all uh, for your excellent talks and thank you all for coming.